Hello everybody and welcome back. Here's a very familiar looking problem. We have already gone through this problem in the context of a test on variance. Remember here we're looking at winter tires, an original standard winter tire that we're comparing to a new winter tire made with a new improved rubber compound. We've already gone through this problem to deal with the issue of whether or not the new tire has a more consistent stopping ability. So for that, we had done a true population F test to determine whether or not the variance in stopping distance of the new tire is less than the variance in stopping distance of the original, the standard tire. And we found that yes, we had evidence to reject. We found that yes, it is in fact stopping more consistently. Now, if you're looking at a winter tire on a car, what are your concerns? Being consistent is nice. You don't want it to be, you know, kind of all over the place. But you also don't want it to take a long distance. You don't want it to take a long time before it actually stops. So when we went through this problem, we realized there's room here for a second test to determine if it's stopping at least as quickly. In addition to being more consistent, which we already know it is more consistent, now we want to make sure that it's stopping at least as quickly, which means that at a maximum, it is stopping the same, taking the same amount of distance as a standard tire or less, right? So it's no worse in terms of its average stopping distance. So when we did the F-test, we defined our populations. Here is population one, population two. That, of course, was based on the constraint and using the F tables that we have to define population one as the population with the larger sample variance. Population two is the one with the smaller sample variance. Here we're doing the T test, and I can really formulate this however I want. I don't have that same constraint. But because this is the second test in a two-test sequence, I'm going to stick with the same definitions. So when I formulate my test, I'm going to stick with those definitions. And here I have the standard tire and the new tire. Now, here I want to formulate my test to make sure that one of the possible outcomes either the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis, shows that it is stopping at least as quickly. So when I see that at least, that includes the equality. So what that means is the null hypothesis has to be consistent with what it is I'm, I'm looking for, that it's stopping at least as quickly, because that includes the equality, that statement includes the equality, and because I know the equality is always in the null hypotheses. So here's the equality, at least as quickly. So what does that mean in terms of distance? That at a maximum, it's equal to, if not less than, equal to or faster than, less far. So that means that my standard tire is at a minimum equal to the stopping distance of the new or greater than, that average distance of the standard is more than. And that then implies if the evidence supports the null hypothesis, I have evidence to show that the average stopping distance of the new tire is at least as quick. In other words, the stopping distance is a maximum equal to that of the standard. Now, I realize that wording is a little bit tricky and part of the complication there is because of how our terms have been defined from the previous question or the first part of this question. And so that leaves me with my alternative hypotheses, which simply shows, and this one is more straightforward, that if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, we have evidence to show that the standard tire is actually stopping in less distance, which of course that means the new tire is stopping in a greater distance. So we have our test laid out. We're performing this at the 
0.1 level of significance. This is a two population T test. So here is my test statistic. Hypothesized difference is the zero, of course, but I'm putting it in there anyways. Now we have already performed a test on the variance. We already know, we already have evidence to show that the variances are not equal. So of course that determines how we calculate our standard deviation, our standard error, as well as our degrees of freedom. That got a little bit messy. Let me just see if I can clean this up. Okay, there's S and there's N. So now I can put in our values. So that T, here I have for the standards 53.2 minus 52.0 divided by four and a quarter squared. Again, pay attention. The problem is giving me a standard deviation, so I have to make sure I square that. If it gave me a variance, don't square it again. It's already squared. And my sample size there is 25. 3.24 squared divided by 30. And so this gives me a value if I put that into my calculator, 53.2 minus 52 divided by, here I have 4.25 squared over 25, 324 squared over 30, and that gives me a test statistic of 1 point, I'll round it a little bit, 1.16 degrees of freedom here. Again, I'm going to save time in these videos. It's that big degrees of freedom calculation because once again, we already have evidence to show that the variances are not equal. And so that's when we need that big calculation, that big formula for degrees of freedom. Here I have my cheat sheet that shows me my degrees of freedom is 44. Now, we're never very precise when we're using our distribution tables anyways. If I go down to my t-tables and I am looking for a distribution with 44 degrees of freedom, well, I'm not going to find it anyways. The best I can do is 40 degrees of freedom. So we're never very precise here. I'm looking for my test statistic, which was 1.16. Here I see it's between these two values. If I trace these back up, I have probabilities. Whoops, too far. I have probabilities here between 0.15 and 0.10. Now, of course, these are upper tail probabilities, which means my test statistic is 1.16. And these are giving me, on these two sides of those critical values, right, these are giving me upper tail probabilities between 0.1 and this whole region here, 0.15. But remember, we're doing a lower tail test which means I want a lower tail probability. So I want 1 minus 0.15 and 1 minus 0.1. Because again, we're doing a lower tail test. So my p-value must come from the lower tail. So if that is the case, then I have a p-value that is less than 0.9 and greater than 0.85, right? This is the 1 minus, oops, 1 minus 15. And this is the 1 minus 0.1. So we've got a pretty massive p-value here. If we use the critical value approach, 
Well, again, I'm looking for that probability 0.05. This is an upper tail probability, yes, but remember this distribution, the t distribution, unlike the f distribution, which we've used, and the chi-square distribution, which are asymmetric, the t distribution, remember, it's symmetric. So here I have 0.05 in the upper tail. When I come back down to our particular variant, I see that critical value is 1.684. That would be the upper tail value. Now remember, we're doing a lower tail test. So my critical value, that T with point we're using alpha as 0.1, not 0.5. I made a mistake. Alpha is 0.1. So that critical value is this one, 1.3. Everything I said about symmetry holds, but I just had the wrong number. So there's a 1.3, but it's in the lower tail. I'll say 44 to be consistent with what we have here, but of course, Remember, we kind of cheated on that. We had to round that value because we don't have very exact t tables. And so that critical value, negative 1.303. So that's it. We've got a lot of evidence here supporting the null hypotheses. I have a t distribution like this. I have a critical value. This is a lower tail test. Alpha is 0.1. Critical value is negative 303. That defines our rejection space. We have a test statistic that is way up here. 1.16, I think. With a p-value, upper tail, lower tail test, so our p-value is all of this region here, right? That's our p-value. So once again, our consistent results using either the p-value approach or the critical value approach, we certainly, we do not reject the null hypotheses. What does that mean? Certainly, we can say that this new rubber compound that we've developed for these winter tires, we have evidence to show that it has reduced the variance, that they do are they, they are in fact more consistent in their stopping distance. Now we can also say that it did not come at a trade-off in terms of its average stopping distance it stops at least as quickly or in a, at most as far of distance or as much of distance. So it's either stopping equal to or less distance than the standard tire. Okay, so that's it. We've gone through both parts of this problem. Hopefully that all makes sense. Thank you all very much for watching. Bye-bye.